Wow, we're almost to the end of this month. Months feel very short at this point. All time just flies by, really. So grab your pen or pencil or whatever you want and get to drawing for 10 minutes and don't frickin' stop drawing for those 10 minutes. Just let it flow, don't erase, nothing. Prove to yourself that you can take the pressure off because that's a skill. So practice it. If time is going to fly by anyway, we might as well spend it drawing, making, creating, hoping, dreaming. While you draw today, let's talk a little more about the one-pointedness of attention that we brought up briefly yesterday. I think this is an important aspect to bring up in our discussion of drawing, mindfulness, and meditation because it helps dispel some of the initial discomforts and confusions of practice. Let me start by making some points that may seem counterintuitive and wrong, and then I'll double back and justify them. Tomorrow we'll try to point out how to use these insights in drawing practice. Okay, so here are the points. One. It's true to say that you are never unfocused. Two, attention is never without an object. Three, attention only has one object at a time. And four, attention and its relationship with an object is out of your control. All right, let's cover point one. You are never unfocused. The idea of distraction or a lack of focus or confusion is a construct, albeit an extremely practical, useful, and persistent one. And it is not in any sense essentially true. If you've listened to other videos on this channel, you've probably heard me talk about the mind space or the field of open awareness and how it's possible to recognize its foundational nature to all other experiences. To continue our discussion, let's assume you have investigated that for yourself through meditation and found it to be true. You've seen that for any experience to be recognized, the part of you that is conscious and awake and receiving must precede it. Seen from that place, distraction or dilution of attention is not strictly possible. Let me ask you, when you're confused or hazy or fitful or restless, do you know you're confused? Or restless? You sure do. That confusion presented itself to you as an experience with a particular flavor. You knew it, glimpsed it, understood it very clearly. You clearly knew that you were confused. So where's the confusion in this situation? It only exists in the meta context of whatever you're grappling with in action over time. You're confused about math or a drawing problem or the plot of a story, but you are not confused about confusion. You are only ever unfocused on the plane of emergent phenomena, jobs, drawing practice, relationships, directions. You are never unfocused in a foundational sense your foundation being the aware and receiving part of your nature. Drugs like anesthesia that we might take as challenging the aware basis of our experience do indeed result in the annihilation of experience completely, not in the dilution of awareness. You can be super high when you come out of anesthesia and saying funny things to your friends, but if you're going to remember what you said in that time, you were aware during it. And if you are not aware while you're being silly, you'll never know what it was like to be you in that time unless someone tells you about it. Let's leave point one there for now, as it's a very deep and foundational discussion that is some people's full-time employment. Fortunately, with that out of the way, the next three points need progressively less explanation. So, point two. Attention is never without an object. 
Not much hope for me to express this in words. It's easier for you to prove it to yourself by just trying. Just try to sit and have attention, any amount of focus, without an object. If you've never practiced meditation or contemplation before, you may think you've achieved this early on, but it's really that you don't even have the necessary concentration to recognize how wandering your attention is, which is funny on its own. Attention is always recognized in the dependent presence of the object it is going with. The breath, a sound, a bodily sensation, even the abstract feeling that can arise momentarily that there is nothing being focused on is actually just a coordination of bodily and mental energy that is being focused on. Any attention separated from object would be equivalent to an anesthesia-like non-experience of a non-thing. It wouldn't happen to you in any recognizable sense. Point three, attention only has one object at a time. We discussed this in the previous video, but to summarize, attention just oscillates so quickly between single points of attention that it feels like you're focusing on multiple things but you're not. You can glimpse this experientially through an open awareness meditation as described in the previous video, where you just follow the stream of consciousness flow of attention to all the various sensory stops it makes for a few minutes. Sharpening your moment-to-moment -moment awareness will reveal you never experience more than one of these inputs at a time, thoughts included. If you're not into contemplation, there's some links in the description to the science that already knows this. This insight from open awareness meditation leads us inevitably, uncomfortably, to the final point. Point four. Attention and its relationship with an object is out of your control. Again, we can jam on this philosophically for something like 6,000 years, but it's really unnecessary because you're proving it to yourself all day every day. If I tell you to focus your attention on your breath for five minutes without interruption, and you try to do it, well, A, you'll fail despite your most Herculean effort, and B, well, why did you listen to me? Why was your attention to my words suitably strong to take them as a conditioning factor for your own actions? I mean, weren't you supposed to be drawing? Shouldn't you be focused on that? How often while you've been drawing in this 10 minute session, has your attention oscillated from your drawing back to me, then back to your drawing, then to your pile of tools, then back to your drawing, and then back to me? Did you choose any of those before doing them? Do you imagine you could succeed if you vowed right now to focus only on your drawing for the rest of this recording without noticing my voice? Do you see the little trick I've been trying to play on you with all of these videos. The proof of this was always right before you. The main resistance to this idea is that if you turn everything off right now and scream, I'm drawing for an hour, screw everything, and then do it, you've proven your attention is under your control. And indeed, your ability to muster circumstances and contexts that narrow the potential space of future possibilities is what makes you a sentient creature but within that hour, your moment-to-moment -moment attention will wax and wane wildly out of your control. And it's really habitual guardrails you've built over time that keep you in your seat, not attention in any realistic sense. It's the fact that you draw for an hour or two hours at this time every day that makes you feel like this is where you're supposed to be. The fact that your door is closed and the TV is off is a reminder that you're supposed to be working right now. The hot coffee on your table is there so that you don't have to go up and get it. These conditions are the foundations of habit, which we all understand is the true mechanism for things getting done. Because if you haven't erected habitual guardrails, but you still draw for six hours today, it's not just your attention letting you do that, but also the energy of the guilt that you've built up from not drawing for weeks, or alternately the intense peace that settled on you randomly today that keeps your ass in the seat. All right, that was a lot. So let's pick this up tomorrow with a discussion of how these insights apply to our drawing practice more directly 
and see how they actually free us up. Thank you for putting in your 10 minutes today, and we'll draw again soon.